So firstly, I would like to start with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land where I'm hosting this webinar from, the Yagara and the Turrbal people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today. We pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within our community. So adaptive planning is a term that it's pretty commonly used within the water industry now, but what is it? We'll be exploring that today. We're going to explore how adaptive planning can be applied to our industry to allow us to continue to make decisions while dealing with an increasing amount of uncertainty. We also wanna have a bit of fun and be interactive during this session. So you would have received the note before about using um, Google Chrome and also the Miro board. So I'll note um, what I've described as being a fusion of technology this afternoon. The interactive game is well used and well known. The mirror boards are also well used. And most of us, if not all of us, would have used Zoom by now. But we haven't used them all together before today. So overall, we want to learn and have very interesting discussions on applying adaptive planning within our industry. So to start that and recognising that some of the um, different technologies may be new to some, we're going to do an icebreaker using the Miro board. So I'll run through a few key points about using that before we get started. Some may have used it and others may be using it for the first time. If anybody is having any difficulties with technology along the way today, please um, make a note in the comments. We've got a team supporting this webinar, so we will do what we can to help you so that you can continue to engage as we go. You'll see there that a link has been added to the chat. Um, remember to use Google Chrome to access Miro and please copy and paste the Miro board link from the comments into Chrome. If you can't see anything when you first enter the Miro board, try scrolling or zooming out and you'll note that there are some sticky notes ready to go. So I'll just give everybody a little bit of time to get that set up and then we'll get started on the icebreaker. I'll do it myself as well. There's a lot of um, people on the Miro board, which is excellent. So what we need to do now is each of us choose a sticky note. And it may be a bit difficult with all of the different arrows buzzing around, but just um, grab one and put your name on it to start with. And then that you can bags it and um, others can move on to a different one. And on the sticky note, I would like each person to answer this question. If you were about to be teleported into the future, say to the year 2070, about 50 years time, what is the one thing that you would choose to take with you to help with the water supply of the future or of the year 2070? And it must fit in a suitcase. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to think about that and write it down and get over any um, technological issues if anybody is having some. So again, just a reminder to put something in the comments and I can see that there's something there. So we'll um, get in contact and try and assist with that. Um, if overall um, you're unable to use the Miro board, please write your answer in the comments and we'll be able to access it there. Otherwise, I'm far away using the mirror board and um, in a couple of minutes, we'll reconvene to discuss.
So we'll just take another minute to finish that. We've got some pretty interesting comments up there at the moment. Okay, so what we'll do now, um, there's a few common themes coming through. We might pick um, one of those and ask um, one of the speakers to just um, discuss very briefly why they selected that one. And there's a couple of, I think, very useful um, ones listed there as well, which we might just highlight as we go through. So there's some similarities there across some of them with um, clay pots or other pots. Would any one of those authors like to just um, have a, a minute or two to explain why you selected that? That's okay. It's easy to, um, without specifying the names, and they don't all have names. Um, I won't do that. Maybe I'll just provide some comment on some general themes that we've got through here. So there's some consistency, um, water supply for the future. There's a few comments relating to filtration of some description, whether it be a camping filter or a mini water treatment plant I saw was listed there that fits in the size of a suitcase, which I've got to say, whoever wrote that one down um, was the reason that we specified a suitcase as well. So that was um, good to see. And um, I did see, and I can't see it. Oh, there it is, nice and big and bold. Um, someone's taking their wife, which is a very wise choice. So I think um, kudos to whoever thought that would be the best thing to take for water supply in the future. And sunscreen as well is also quite a practical item to take. In terms of themes coming through though, we've got something to collect the water in with the pots and we've got a few items there something to treat the water with either chlorination or filtration and also there's mention of pumps so also to actually um, transfer the water so even in 50 years time there's some consistencies that we expect to see with our water supply so thanks everybody for joining in on that um, icebreaker the intention behind it was really to get familiar with the Miro board and have a practice using it. Because as I mentioned before, this is going to be an interactive session. So I hope everybody enjoys it. I'll leave it at that. Um, and really just note there's, you know, adaptive planning is about recognising the uncertainties of the future. So in the year 2070, there will be a lot of things that are different to how they are now. But we want to be able to continue to make decisions um, regardless of all of those uncertainties. Keep our options open and have the flexibility to be able to respond to future trends and shocks. So on that note, I will hand over now to Shane Tyrrell, who will provide us with an introduction to adaptive planning. And thanks all for playing the icebreaker. Thank you, Kate. Um... And Kate, can you just let me know that you can see the presentation on my screen? It's just started sharing, Shane, so there we go. It's all good. Great, okay. So thanks everyone for your time and for the opportunity to, to share my thoughts on adaptive planning. Um, well, I say my thoughts, but I've collected a bit of information from um, a number of people eminent in this space. And um, I really just want to give you a bit of a, a, a very brief rundown on adaptive planning in the water industry and where we are in our journey. Um, and some of the basic concepts around um, how adaptive planning is, is evolving. So 
something that sort of helps us frame up why we do adaptive planning is the, let me get this right, the Kinevin framework. Um, I think it's a, a really interesting way to, to describe why we do adaptive planning. So, um, you know, just, just describing the, the quadrants there, you've got, um, you've got problems in the simple space. They're the domain of best, best practice. We generally know how to solve them. Um, and we can replicate that process over and over again. So it's really about sensing what we need to do and just responding with a best practice solution. You've then got the complicated space. Uh, so this is the domain of the experts. This is where uh, we use expert, experts to help us understand the problem, analyze it and come up with a response. Usually it involves some sort of long-term plan or blueprint. You've got the complex area. There's a domain where um, the problem and our knowledge of the problem is emerging uh, and we don't necessarily have a solution or even a plan for that matter. Um, it's emerging practices fall into that field and you, you're generally probing the, the external environment to understand what challenges you're facing, you're sensing and responding to those challenges. And then you're in the, you've got the chaos quadrant, the, 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 the chaotic domain, and that's the domain where you really need to respond rapidly and quickly to whatever problem is arising. Generally, you don't take a planned approach. You take a, a very quick action. And then after that action, you sort of respond to what played out. Obviously, we don't want to be in the chaotic space, but some things do pop up and, and we do end up playing in that space. And then there's the disorder space. The disorder space, we don't want to be there. We want to, we want to gather information and understand our problem better. Um, and so that we can move into the appropriate quadrant. So when I think of adaptive planning, I think of taking things from the complex world where we're just, it's an emerging issue. It's usually driven by some sort of external driver. And, um, and we try to move that into the complicated space where we can use experts and specialists to um, come up with a, a plan and that's where adaptive planning fits in. Um, we might not know what the future holds. We might not know enough about the issue itself or how best to respond to the issue, but we can still come up with a plan. Uh, and the plan might not give us the answer. It might give us a, a set of actions that we can use to respond as the future unfolds. Uh, just sharing also some levels of uncertainty. So this is adapted from decision-making under deep, deep uncertainty. Uh, is a, a piece of work by Mark Chow et al. in uh, 2019. So you start with complete determination. That's where you know exactly what the answer is. There's no planning to do. And then you move into the level one area where we recognise that there is some uncertainty, but we have a pretty clear picture of where we're headed. And that's the old sort of, um, you come up with a forecast, you build what you need to meet that forecasted outcome. So you've got a You've got a lot of confidence in, in where you're headed. Then you've got the sort of the risk space. It's where we're dealing with several alternative futures, but we're able to come up with pretty good probabilities on, on how those futures are going to play out. And you can, you can select a solution that we consider acceptable risk. You move into rank ordering. So this is where you have a few plausible futures. This is where, um, this is where scenario analysis generally fits in. Um, and you generally select the option that is most favorable across a range of scenarios. So the issue with um, rank ordering is that you analyze the, the field within the bounds of those scenarios and, and you don't necessarily acknowledge what's, what lands outside of those scenarios. Then you move into the deep uncertainty area and that's where you've got many plausible futures. Um, so you, you can come up with a whole range of scenarios and there's, we know that there's a whole range of scenarios that we won't, that, that, that could exist that, or could, could unfold that we're not able to define. Um, and generally there's a lot of potential outcomes for all those different scenarios. So it's a much wider field of possibilities than the typical rank ordering scenario planning process. And then you've got the recognized ignorance. So I, I guess black swans fit into this field where we actually, we don't know a lot about, about them, how they're going to unfold. Um, and we'll generally try to um, move those towards more of a, an uncertainty field rather than being um, make, making, rather than them just being completely unknown. 
and then you move into total, total ignorance where you don't even know that you don't know. Hopefully we're not there very much. And so these last two areas, deep uncertainty and, and the black swan type events is where we use the decision-making under deep uncertainty and adaptive planning techniques. So what are the consequences of uncertainty? There's actually probably a lot more than this, but these are a few that I like to call out. So the first one is decision paralysis. So a lot of organizations realize that the future is uncertain and, and act, this actually creates a lot of inertia. It means that an organization may not have the confidence to make a decision and inadvertently is making a decision by not making a decision to do nothing. Um, so we can have decision paralysis and we do see that um, quite a bit. So an example of that is, you know, we don't want to upgrade this particular asset because we're not really sure whether that's the right solution for the future. Then you've got path dependency. So this is where future decisions are limited by past decisions or past events. So this is where, um, you know, we, we generally want to stick to the things that we're good at, that we know, that, are, that we consider to be less, lower risk. Um, and we don't push ourselves into um, other areas that might be more valuable, give a better outcome. And then you've got option lock-in. So this is where um, we may choose a solution and it might be a BA, big, big concrete BAU solution, like a, a big desalination plant or big concrete pipe. And once you've built it, you're locking out options to do things differently for quite some time because you've already spent the money, it's in the ground. Your most efficient solution after you've spent the money is to continue to use that asset. And so that, that, that's the option lock-in. We want to avoid that because there may be a whole lot of options on the horizon that are, are way more valuable or efficient than the one that we, we're looking at. Just calling out that um, there's a lot more to adaptiveness than adaptive planning. Um, so you've got, you know, you've got the adaptive process continuum includes adaptive strategy, adaptive planning, and adaptive management or adaptive operation. So you know, adaptiveness is something that can be employed right across a project life cycle or a business or an industry. Um, it's not just adaptive planning, but it, it's the, we, we are honing in a bit on adaptive planning in this session. And this is consistent with the plan, prepare, respond and recover approach to resilience. So that's where adaptive planning really, really shines. One thing that we're also starting to learn is that you really need to, you can't just do it. You can't just develop an adaptive plan. Um, you, if you if you create an adaptive plan and, you've, and you don't have the governance framework sitting around it, then it's got nowhere to go. You may not be able to make an investment decision because that adaptive plan isn't compatible with how you make investment decisions in your business or how your external stakeholders make investment decisions. So we do need to consider the governance frameworks and all the supporting structures to incorporate adaptive planning into our businesses and our industry. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I just wanted to touch on a few adaptive planning tools. Um, so we've, we've, we're going to discuss adaptive planning pathways in a bit of detail. That's one that we use quite a bit in adaptive planning. I've also touched on the, the Kinevin model, um, but there are a number of other tools that we can use in adaptive planning. I guess the key thing to highlight here is that um, there's lots of different tools. Uh, they are They've, they've all got varying levels of, of, of depth and, and detail of analysis there and, and complexity and application, and they can all be applied either in different parts of the, of the project delivery process or um, alternative tools for a particular part of that process. So we've got a big job, I think, to as we progress adaptive planning in the water industry to, to get a better handle on what tools we use when um, how much data do you need to be able to use a certain tool to make your decision or create your plan? Um, and what level of analysis are you doing? How much do you have to invest in this? And what sorts of tools are most appropriate for your application? So just touching on adaptive planning pathways approach, and, and this is something we've, we've worked with Delta Areas on quite a bit. Um, and I know they've done a lot of work on, on that in, in um, well, right around the world, but particularly in the Netherlands is where this approach emerged with the Resilient Deltas Initiative. So this is, and, and this is not to say, this is quite a common approach. So um, a lot of uh, practitioners are adopting something similar to this, but effectively um, 
the way to deliver an adaptive planning project in the, in the initial stage is to um, define the problem is the first step. And, and that's something that's not done well in the water industry, in my opinion. Uh, it's really important to understand what problem you're trying to solve because that drives everything. You need to understand the challenge. What are the risks and opportunities? What are those uncertainties that are driving this issue that you're trying to solve? And what are the objectives? What are you trying to get out of it? Then we get into the more um, traditional uh, engineering or planning type um, techniques like developing solutions, so long lists, short lists, portfolios of actions. Um, then, then the next step is to create adaptation pathways. So this is a really important step. This is about acknowledging that different actions have a certain sell by date. So you may implement a particular action, but it's only solves your issue or meets your performance requirement for a period of time, say 10 years. And then that defines when you need to take, well, that defines when the next action needs to be implemented. And then you, you, from that, you can create a pathways map. So it's effectively a, uh, a number of sequences of actions that you can take to deliver the level of service or the outcome that you require while responding to different futures as they may unfold. The next step then is to design the adaptive plan. So developing adaptive pathways isn't it. That's by a long shot, that's not an adaptive plan. That's just a tool that we use. Um, so the adaptive plan takes those pathways and understands the lead times for implementation, uh, when you need to make decisions and how you're gonna, what action you're gonna take now, given what you've just learned about what the future plans are. And then probably the most important thing is implementing the plan. So implement those least regrets, short-term actions, keep an eye on the medium and long-term options and make sure you're keeping the options open that you think might be quite valuable to, to the business or the community in the future. And make sure you've got a plan to monitor the, to monitor the adaptive plan over time. And then the key thing is to monitor, learn and adapt. So an adapt, one of the key things about adaptive plan is you can't just do it once and then come and come leave it on the shelf and come back to it in five years. I reckon even doing it annually is probably not really how you do adaptive planning robustly. You need to be understanding what changes in the external environment might be influencing your plan and then how you might need to adapt or change your plan to respond to that. You need to be continually learning, filling those gaps in knowledge that you need to make a, a robust decision. And every time you learn that thing, you should be coming back and revising your plan. So I think of a, an adaptive plan or adaptive strategy as a living plan or strategy. It's something that someone needs to be there, living it, updating it, monitoring it, making sure that it's uh, as robust and up to date as, as it can possibly be. Just another thing to note on this, and we've I've, I've got a fairly crude continuous feedback revision and refinement loop there, but uh, this is a little bit of a linear process still, whereas adaptive planning should very much be iteratively iterative and circular. So, you know, you should be as you develop your solutions and developing your adaptation pathways, you should be coming back and saying, is our the problem we define still the right problem? Um, has anything changed, and are we responding to that problem program? that problem properly. When you're designing your, when you're implementing the adaptive plan, we should be feeding back the knowledge that we learn in the implementation process back into, into the solutions that were identified and the adaptation pathways. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it's very much a, a circular process, an iterative process, but it's quite hard to show on a, on a slide. Um, so what is an adaptive Adaptation pathways map is a it's a key well, what I think to be a key step in an adapt, adaptive plan, adapt, adaptive planning. So this is one that's um, it was developed by Delta Reds and TU Delft in the Netherlands. Um, it's dynamic adaptive policy pathways, and we're luckily lucky enough to have um, Simone de Klimacher and Andrew Warren from Delta Reds who are involved in this piece of work. So this just shows at a very high level what an adaptation pathways map looks like. Um, it just shows a group of, or a number of actions that you could take on the left-hand side there, action A, B, C, D. Uh, it shows the current situation. And the little triangle is saying that we need to make a decision pretty much now on what our next action is going to be. So following that gray line along, 
you then see that you've got a number of different actions you can take. Um, and that's sometime in the next, what is it, two to three years, looking at the two scenarios on the bottom of the page. The action you take um, will depend on what's happening at that time. But as it's so close in time, you probably need to make a decision now about what your preferred action is. If you take action B, you can see that you're going to need to take another action in the, in the short to medium term because that action's got a sell by date, which is the little black line of around six to eight years or eight, eight to nine years, it looks like. And then you could move on to um, implementing action A or C or D. But you need to make a decision about whether you want to make a what is probably a larger investment on action A or D that will get you through for the next 100 years plus, or whether you want to spend probably spend a little bit less on action C, but then in in roughly the next 100 to 80 to 100 years, you then need to make another decision and take another action. And the little circles show you where you can transfer to different actions. The triangles are showing you when you need to make a decision and the little black line is, is showing when that particular act, what the sell by date of that particular action is when you, when it no longer meets the service outcome you require. And then you can use that, uh, those combination of actions or pathways to create portfolios. And on the right hand there, you can see there's a number of portfolios of options there and you can assess the performance of those to understand which pathways are preferable. And the reason I say it that way is not, not picking a pathway is because you really shouldn't be picking a, lot, uh, picking a pathway or picking a long-term strategy when you're doing adaptive planning. You should only be picking what your short-term short action is, the decision you may need to make now. It, the, it, in the longer term, you should be keeping your options open and you should be keeping all of those um, attractive and viable pathways on the, on the table as the future unfolds. And here's just an example of um, uh, quite, a, quite a bit more uh, uh, extensive adaptive pathways map. So this is one that was done, um, I won't tell you who the client is, but for a confidential client, but you can see here that there's a range of BAU actions that could be taken and a range of alternative or innovative type approaches. And the, the key thing here was um, that it was, it, it was uh, the, the stage one BAU augmentations were selected um, in combination with trials. And the idea there was to buy ourselves a little bit of time to understand whether those alternative or innovative solutions would work, whether we could get, um, get buy-in from the business and from the regulator. And then if we could do that, we could choose to go down this alternative or more innovative type pathway to, towards the bottom of the page. But if we found that those trials weren't working out, we may have had to go back to the BAU type augmentations and possibly pursue those alternative approaches further and make a, a, a different decision in the future or go down the BAU path. So it allows you to not only to keep your options open, but it highlights the things that you need to do to better understand and to unlock those, um, those future options that might create great value for the community. And that's an example of a preferred portfolio that I was just describing there, assuming that the trials worked and this alternative solution was an amazing success. And then we just rolled out that alternative solution. And, the, and it, for, as an example, this alternative solution here would save the business about $400 million over the long term. Here's one that I've um, <clears throat> borrowed from Simone. <laughs> it's one of her analogies, that I, but I really like it. Um, you know, it's the, it's the frog, frog in the pot analogy, you know, as if, if we're not aware of our surroundings, as the pot, the, the water starts lukewarm and as the pot slowly warms up, the frogs boil without even noticing it. So we need to be really aware of the external environment and how, th how our environment is changing and use this to, to guide and to provide input to our strategy over time. So an adaptive plan should include a system to monitor the effectiveness of the options and to trial and learn things so that we can unlock future options. We should be monitoring our signposts, the, the, the things that are telling us whether something is happening or a trigger is, is approaching 
where we need to act. We should be uh, exploring new and emerging technology and, not, and gaining new knowledge that will help us um, deliver solutions that great, create greater value. We should be monitoring whether our track is, whether our plan is on track. Do we need to modify or adjust it? Do we need to take corrective actions? And we also need to make sure we're monitoring that the organisation, that we have organisational commitment and investment capacity. Uh, a big risk is that you assume that something can be done in the future, but then there's no capacity to invest in it in the future. And then that may make the short term decision that you made not the optimal decision because that follow on action wasn't taken. So there's a risk there that we need to monitor. This is just going into a little bit more detail on um, what we talked about having governance processes in place around adaptive planning so that when you do the adaptive plan or create the adaptive plan, we can then implement it, we can fund it and we can incorporate it into the broader business. So this is a, a, a workshop that we did with our colleagues at Hunter Water just to look at um, how, how we might be able to transition to adaptive planning in a way that enhances outcomes through investment decisions. And the key thing that came out of that was that we need to engage with our institutional stakeholders, regulators and communities to develop all the governance structures and all the, all the other things outside of the adaptive plan that will align with and help us implement that adaptive planning approach. And the journey continues. continues. Um, I've listed out uh, a few things, adaptive planning projects that have happened in the past. The, the image up there is one that we, uh, that have, Ivona did a great job of mapping out during our session with Hunter Water and it just maps out the the um, the journey that they went on in the Netherlands with the Resilient Deltas initiative, which was really interesting. Some of the issues that we're seeing, there's lots of different terminology being used, both outside and within organisations, differing levels of rigour and understanding of adaptive processes, difficulty in deciding which tools to use. Um, government frameworks and, and investment decision making may struggle with adaptive planning. Adaptive pathway maps may be developed, but then we revert back to traditional tradition, traditional servicing options. So we just pick a winner and implement that winner, which is not right. And poor or no implementation planning and monitoring. So they're the things that we need to tackle, I think, in the water industry to, to do adaptive planning better. Thank you very much. Um, now I was going to save questions on this one until the uh, until the panel session at the end, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and the next step was to move into our our resilient deltas game. So I'm just going to share the Miro board. If you just bear with me. There we go. Okay, um, so we're going to um, have a thought experiment. Uh, and the idea here is to, we've, we've adapted the Resilient Deltas game um, to, it's normally done in person, but we've adapted it to a Miro board, to a, an online workshop type situation. So bear with us. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it allows us to explore the Resilient Deltas game and adaptive planning, uh, but it is also the first time that we've tried to put it into something like a Miro board. So bear with us, but I think it'll be really interesting exercise and great discussion. So um, I'll pass over to Simone to introduce us to the game. Thanks, Shane. Um, yeah, indeed. So thanks for that uh, presentation. I think it was an excellent way to summarize all the key steps of adaptive planning and, and everything that comes with it. Um, uh, what we're now going to do indeed is, a, is an adaptive, adaptive version of the sustainable Delta game developed by Delta Aris to, to uh, get a more visual experience of, of some of the things you just mentioned. Um, and, and I think you just shared a lot of information and a lot of knowledge. Um, uh, and it, it takes time and, and experience to uh, really uh, Get, get everything on board. And, and this is a first step to, to introduce you to some of the elements. Um, so we call it a um, thought experiment. Um, and it's just a way to uh, have a discussion together. Um, yeah, next one, please. So we're going to talk about uncertainty, uh, maybe even deep uncertainty. 
and what can be causes of that and how you can still prepare, make decisions uh, under that uncertainty. And of course, moving to adaptive planning. Uh, so today we're gonna uh, pretend that we're um, the mayor of a, a river delta region. Um, so this is an, uh, an, uh, an image of, of our area. We, we have a lovely, lovely town along the river. It's a low lying area. Uh, agriculture is a big part of the um, industry. Um, the people are living uh, partially in uh, floodplains and partially in, uh, in a bit more hilly area, um, which are hidden from view in this uh, image. Uh, and the, the river is not only used as a, um, a major driver of, of the water state of the region, but also, as you can see, for, uh, for navigation. That's the setting. Um, if we look at um, flood safety, we're the mayor, so we're responsible for everything, but flood safety will be uh, on the top of our agenda for today. Um, if we look uh, in the recent years, we start, uh, we look at the a time series here of the um, annual maximum discharge, peak discharge in the river, our river. And we see since 1940 until uh, now, 2018, and maybe even 2021, uh, we see a bit of a, a fluctuation uh, of the discharges, mainly in the bandwidth of four to 8,000 uh, cubic uh, meter per second. Uh, and everything was good and well until 1994, uh, where we see that we uh, the maximum uh, discharge uh, exceeded our uh, threshold, so our safety level, which was about 11,000 cubic. Fortunately, flooding, the damage wasn't too, too bad. It, it, um, it hit a few uh, nine farmhouses, so it's not nothing, but it was, uh, it was limited. Um, thing is, the year after we had a, a near flood, so just below our uh, safety margin, but it was quite scary nonetheless, because everybody still had fresh memories of last year. Um, so that was enough. For, for, for everybody to want to take action. So a few years later, you see the red line go up and now they've taken, uh, we've taken uh, measures to increase our safety level to 12,000 uh, cubic meter per second uh, of um, maximum discharge. That's the current situation uh, in our lovely town. Um, but of course we are responsible looking to the future. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty, but if we, if we focus on flood safety, um, we can look at climate change, obviously. Um, so uh, climate change might mean bigger peak flows, also uh, longer droughts, but we won't be looking into that today. Um, we have our lovely levees, and we've just seen that they've increased our security level, safety level, but they might, they might fail, of course, due to a combination of uh, factors. Uh, upstream development, uh, we have uh, very good uh, relationships with our neighboring towns um, and they might grow, which might lead them to take actions themselves to, um, to diminish the, uh, the discharge in the river to, to keep them safe. But, you know, things they do upstream might benefit us downstream as well, or influence at least. And then uh, population growth, uh, you know, we um, like everywhere, uh, our town might be growing, which means we will be building more uh, houses and industry in the floodplain that has an impact on our risk as a, as a community. And uh, we can potentially have, count on economic growth in the future to pay for any uh, future uh, flood safety projects, but maybe, maybe not, who knows? And then of course we need to, uh, be aware that uh, the current political climate is not uh, might not uh, remain for always. So we need to make sure that we uh, can take the decisions later that we think are a good idea to, uh, currently. So uncertain future. Um, and with that setting, um, we're going to move into uh, four different breakout rooms uh, to split up into four teams uh, and to experience the game. Um, and we have, uh, we'll tell in the game how long we have, and then afterwards we reconvene together to, uh, to discuss the uh, findings. Chris. Thanks.
Okay. So is everyone back? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Andrew, yep. and we okay, are perfect. back. Perfect. Um, to my group, I apologise that we didn't get to the discussion. If you do want to add some discussion notes in the in the in the discussion box on post it's in the Miro board, please feel free. And I say that to if I zoom out all the groups because I see that no one got to the discussion <laughs> or, or didn't certainly didn't put any uh, any any post it's in there. Um, but if you do want to reflect on how you played the game and the actions that you took and the reasons for doing so uh, dur during your games, then then please, whilst I'm whilst I'm talking, please feel free to to click on your Miro board and um, and choose uh, and, and 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 take a post-it note and think about uh, why you took those um, the measures that you did, what perhaps you might have done differently, and these sorts of things. Anyhow, um, someone's frantically copying each of the team choices down into the into the bottom boxes. So I'll leave uh, I'll leave that to go and move into um, the debrief. So my apologies. I'm going to skip through the introduction. There we go. Um, I need to share my screen. Apologies. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Let me know if you cannot. All good. All good. Perfect. Right. So this was the this was essentially the last uh, the last screen you should have seen in in each of your games, um, where we have uh, we have the, the complete um, time series for for the hundred years that we were looking at of the peak discharges. You can see that there was um essentially 50 years of of very low peak discharges nothing to worry about where we were below our critical value um our original critical value that is and then uh there were two very large peaks um in the middle of the middle of the century or mid mid, mid to late part of the century um where we would have needed additional protections either from upstream negotiation which uh, seems always doomed to failure, in my opinion, um, or in my experience of this game, very much so. Um, or we needed to upgrade our flood flood defences in some way, um, either through adapting our buildings or or raising raising our levees or, or implementing room for the river. And following those two peaks, uh, the the peak discharges went back down again. Um, and so this just goes to show that when it comes to peak discharge in a river uh, and looking for a climate signal, it's uh, it's pretty difficult to find one. Um, because peak events, they're extreme events, it's not necessarily a trend based, uh, trend based uh, uh, change. So you can you can see here that uh, maybe there's climate change, maybe there isn't. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that, um, touch on that in a little, little more detail in the next couple of slides. But what you might have also seen is um, in this game, we're very much focused on the technical decision and, 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 and upgrading options in terms of uh, flood protection and, and so on and so forth. But the other thing that can change in all of this is uh, our, our social values in, in, and, 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 and uncertainties around ambiguity. Um, that are driven by ambiguity. And we saw that a little bit coming in where uh, in the second round, I think the nature, um, the nature groups were, were, were really advocating for, for more, more public space and um, improved water quality and these sorts of things. And that's not to say that um, the, the nature groups don't exist now, of course they do, but perhaps on a broader societal level, um, our values are going to shift and, and our priorities are going to change as a society. And we, we certainly see that. This is uh, um, what's on the screen is a, an example from the Netherlands where uh, traditionally the, the flood protection approach has been raise the dikes, raise the dikes, raise the dikes, raise the dikes. It's pretty simple. Um, as each flood event has occurred, if we need to raise them further, we raise them further. 
But what's happened in the last 10 to 20 years is very much a value shift where spatial planning is becoming much more important. Um, how uh, the, the, the social fabric of, 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 of towns and um, space to recreate and space for nature, um, water quality concerns, all of these things are coming to play. The, 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 the planning um, context is becoming much more much more complex or being recognized for being much more complex than it used to be. Um, and that consequently means that people uh, prioritize different things and and certainly options such as room for the river or, or taking some, um, some, some other actions become more attractive than the simple uh, conventional approach of, of raising your levies. But going back to our time series, we just played one one scenario, we just played one potential uh, uh, climate future, if you will. And for those of you who are interested, we were playing a future that had no climate change in there. That was just literally natural variability um, in terms of uh, peak river discharges. There's, uh, we could have played a, a scenario where we did have uh, climate change um, and this W plus scenario, these are Dutch scenarios, is, is, is a scenario that's akin to um, RCP 8.5. So it's high climate change. And you can see that uh, if we had have played that scenario, then our peak discharges could have been much, much greater. Um, and uh, even the measures that we had on the table, the 16,000 ones wouldn't have been sufficient. Uh, and you can certainly see that, yes, there is a bit more of a trend in terms of increasing peak discharges. But again, would you be able to tell that you were in a um, high climate future versus a, 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 a traditional climate future um, or a, a no climate change future, that's, that's, uh, that's debatable. Um, and then of course, that's only two possible futures. And there are an infinite number of futures when it comes to climate change. Uh, we can't yet, we don't, do not yet know what it's going to look like or how, how big it will be will uh, its impacts will be, how extreme uh, extreme uh, wet weather events that, that drive peak discharges in our rivers, how, how, how extreme they will be, how frequent they will be. Um, and if we, going back to, I saw this was a question that, that popped up early in, um, uh, in Shane's presentation, I believe. Uh, how do we tell what our future is? How do we monitor? How do we find out what our triggers should be? Um, how do we find the right signals? And that's that's a really interesting point to to, to dwell upon because I mean, if we look at these these three graphs, this is just the the high climate and low climate future um, for two different uh, peak discharge for two different patterns of natural variability. Okay, the neither of which was the ones that we, oh no, maybe the top two are the ones that we ended up playing. The top one is the one we ended up playing. Um, and then the, the bottom one, the bottom two are a different different pattern of natural variability, but both with, with climate change and without climate change. And if you look at a 50 year time um, cut, it's pretty difficult to, to, to pick a difference between any of them, right? If you take that time horizon out to 27 uh, to, to 75 years, maybe you can start to see a bit of a trend in the in the in terms of climate change leading to to to, to increase peaks. It starts to become apparent, um, and then certainly in the in the last one, you can see that there is some. There's definitely been a growth in in the peak discharges, but it's tricky. It's really tricky to to work out what 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 is an appropriate signal, um, and. Again, in terms, of if we bring that back to our decision making, um, this is a different time series. It's got bears no relation to, to the time series you played in the game. But you will note that where we took our cut, where we made our cuts, where we made our rounds, that should have influenced the way that you made your, your decisions. Um, where things were going well, we felt relatively confident, we didn't need to do too much. Uh, then suddenly those two peak discharges occurred. Um, and uh, and in the next round, everyone wanted to do more because they felt that, oh, hang on, that's just the beginning. These peaks are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. 
which didn't turn out to be the case. Um, and that just in, shows you how intrinsic this desire to react to 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 events um, is within our within us. Uh, and, and what we're trying to do with, with, with methodologies like decision making under deep uncertainty or adaptation pathways or, or the various other approaches that Shane mentioned in his presentation is to try and be more anticipatory, try and be more proactive in our planning so that, uh, um, uh, and more scenario independent so that uh, whatever the future, however the future turns out, we can flexibly adapt to that. Um, and in a much more proactive way rather than a reactive way. So this is just looking at way that, as I say, the way we cut um, our time series and where we make our decisions can influence uh, can influence the, the the decisions that we take. So I'll skip through that because I, I do realise that I'm talking quite a while here. Um, and to bring it back to this idea of looking for signals, uh, I don't want to overstate this, this is not easy. Uh, we don't yet know what are good signals. What we do know is the characteristics of a good signal. And the characteristics of a good signal are ones where there is um, limited noise and where it provides a really strong indication that you are on a particular trajectory. So this is some work that my um, my colleague Marilyn Harsnote did uh, a few years back, looking at um, again, peak discharges in a river very similar to the one that we played in the game. Uh, and in terms of looking at uh, trying to find out when, whether or not we were in a high climate future or a low climate future, and wh what the impact of that would be on, on peak discharges, then actually what came out from, from that work was that you shouldn't necessarily be monitoring your peak discharges. So this top graph is, is uh, the, the, the time series for all the potential um, ensembles that were that were modeled, right? So that's why there's all, all these um, uh, shadings around the lines. Uh, for the 10 year return flow, which is essentially, you know, your peak discharge, a monitor, a, a monitoring, a monitorable um, peak discharge. So one that occurs relatively frequently. And you can see that there's a lot of noise um, around the black line, around the red line and around the blue line. The blue line is high climate change, the red line is low climate change and the black line is no climate change. But even at this point where my hand is, I'm assuming you can see my hand, um, I have no idea whether or not I'm getting a value from the blue line, the red line or the black line, right? Um, from, the, from that ensemble of scenarios. I have no idea. And it's only really right at the very end where the noise dis, uh, disappears to a point that if I was on that blue, that high climate line, I could confidently say, yes, we're in a high climate future. Whereas if we look at a different parameter, completely different, where here we've got annual mean dry season flow. So we're looking at low flows instead. You see that that signal is much stronger, much earlier, and there's much less noise. So the, what, what we can conclude from this is very much, we need to put in work to find the right signals to monitor. And the signals that we're looking for are signals in the external environment that give us an indication that the condition that is of interest to us, peak discharge in this instance, is going to change in an undesirable direction. Um, and that's, that, that's the key thing to, to hear. And as I say, it's, 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 not, it's not easy um, and it takes quite a bit of work. Uh, to, to find these types of parameters, but uh, but that's that's the work that we essentially need to do if we're going to be able to monitor our adaptive plans effectively. So just in terms of wrapping up this 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 portion of the uh, the presentation um, and, and the game, uh, again, let's reflect back on on um, the arguments you used to to implement the actions. Were you being reactive? Did you feel that you were being proactive and, and anticipatory? Um, perhaps some of you scooted down your Miro boards and saw what was coming in the future and, and, and um, well, cheated. <laughs> um, but yeah, in hindsight, would you have played it differently? What would you have done? How would, which measures do you think you would have, uh, would have implemented? And this is not about looking at the water level graph that we put in the game and saying, how can I optimize my performance against that water level graph? 
but how could I optimize my performance against all the potential peak water level graphs that are out there? Um, and, and these are the types of questions that uh, we, we would invite you to, to again, pick up a post-it on, on the Miro board in, 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 your, in your team sessions and, and, and place some suggestions down. And we, we can certainly um, look at those, uh, track those um, later and bring them back into the discussion uh, for, for, for the panel. Um, oh. In terms of uncertainties, Shane's already covered this, so I'm not going to go, go into it, but in the game, we had a lot of different uncertainties at play, climate change, spatial developments, and these sorts of things. There's a whole gamut of uncertainties. And for my mind, the biggest ones that we often ignore are the ambiguities. And these are where people think differently, believe differently, have different perceptions, which leads to uncertainty um, in terms of the decisions that we can make. Uh, and resolving those ambiguities is, is, is one of the most difficult parts of decision making of under deep uncertainty. So that's, I, I leave you with that thought. Um, and at this point, I will hand over to Abel, who is going to lead the panel discussion for the final uh, part of this webinar. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, if I might get uh, David Durkin, Wayne Middleton, uh, Pierre McCaber, and Andrew, if you can stay with your video yep. turned on and also your mic, um, that would be great. Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to uh, welcome our panel to take some questions. Um, I'll introduce them briefly and then I'll open it up with some, uh, some, some questions. David is uh, the Program Director for Water Resilience at Hunter Water Corporation and uh, he's been with Hunter Water for about eight years but he's had quite an interesting uh, background working in the US uh, in construction um, and also as an environmental engineer in, in Australia. Uh, David's been looking at complex things like future of biosolids management and uh, potential energy production as well. So welcome, David. Uh, Wayne Middleton, uh, he's the manager for water supply planning for uh, Secwater. Wayne has worked also in the UK and uh, in Southeast Queensland and uh, he has held senior, senior roles in uh, pretty much every aspect of planning, design, construction, program management, and so on. So very informed. Uh, you can imagine dealing with flooding uh, at one end of the spectrum and also droughts at the other end of the spectrum. So uh, he lives with complexity. Uh, Pierre McCaber. Uh, Pierre is working at uh, uh, Institute for Sustainable Futures, University of Technology, Sydney. And uh, Pierre, I've had the privilege of working with Pierre on some uh, fairly ad innovative approaches to adaptive planning in wastewater services uh, for Queensland urban utilities. So Pierre's leading the water futures research. So he's looking at adaptive planning. Um, and back about nearly 10 years ago, Pierre wrote some papers on adaptive planning approaches. Um, so welcome, Pierre. And Andrew, thanks again for the wrap up. And uh, Andrew's uh, colleague, uh, Simone, is also based in, um, in Brisbane. Andrew is based in the Netherlands, so I think we did a, a good swap <laughs> sending an Aussie up there and getting uh, Simone down here. So thanks again. Um, I'm going to open it up with some questions uh, which would, I think, explore some of the concepts of adaptive planning. So I might pick on you, Pierre, first, because uh, you're used to that. Um, back in 2011-12, you, you developed adaptive planning for the urban water resilience, looking at water supply. So not so much flooding, but the drought end of the spectrum, if you like, uh, and the uncertainties that that brings. Uh, and I think that was done for Melbourne water. Um, and that had a 50 year outlook. And more recently, um, you've been working with Sydney Water on the concept of be comfortable that there's no preferred scenario. And that's part of adaptive planning. Why do you think this is important? Thanks, Abel. Um, so maybe just to kind of tell a story and explain how the thinking's progressed, I'll start with the Melbourne experience where um, this is about, about eight years ago, we were, we were contracted to help them develop their water supply demand strategy. And I'll say up front now, it was probably quite deterministic if we look back on it, the way we approached it. Um, we considered two potential investment approaches against four preferred scenarios, which were based on you know, the traditional climate change versus population growth scenarios that, that most people would have done in the past. Uh, but despite this being fairly deterministic and sort of 
working towards a preferred set of scenarios, um, we're still able to show that incrementally building decentralized wastewater um, recycled schemes provided a lower range of costs against the four uh, potential scenarios. So even though you were spending money up front to, to put infrastructure in place, your resilience was a lot stronger and you were much more flexible in your responses so that even though you then under extreme conditions may have had to bring on a new desal plant, the, the base of your resilience for most of the, the changes in your assumptions um, was, was kind of built in to this, this flexible arrangement that was being constructed on a kind of gradual process rather than doing nothing and suddenly um, having to build a desal plant, for example, in response to a, um, a severe drought. And this approach is, has kind of served plan as well so far, um, but now we're kind of facing rapid changes in, in both our assumptions about the future, but also the objectives that we're planning for are changing. Uh, you know, we're not only just doing water supply demand strategies, but we're also looking at things around uh, livability and urban cooling and, and other benefits that can be derived from our water services. So we've moved from as Shane was explaining in the Kniffen um, framework, we've moved from the complicated space to a much more complex space. And the challenge with that is that we are generally still only equipped with complicated tools, if you like, to, to deal with complicated problems. And um, the challenge then is, is that we, we need to, to move away from, from planning um, for predetermined or predefined scenarios because that isn't the future. Um, we need to, to avoid setting adaptive plans as an outcome with, with you know, portfolios of, of, invest, of, of interventions that best deal with our best guess of, of what that future might be. So, so we kind of need to move to um, move away from plans and move, move towards planning as, a, as an approach. It kind of reviews the changes in our assumptions as well as the changes in, in objectives and, and potential uh, servicing strategies. I work with Sydney Water, it kind of took that to the next level and we were looking at, at ways of communicating this, this process um, as well as the value of flexibility to senior managers and to stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So specifically, why, um, why was setting a plan for, for, preferred, um, for preferred future with, with a set of preferred um, pathways or, or best fit pathway that um, best addressed all possible futures was not a good approach, but rather spending um, money now to keep options open was, was, a, was the challenge that was, that was put to us. So we needed to explain why um, flexibility to respond to future changes was important and spending a little bit now to keep options open was something that <laughs> I guess the, the accountants in, in water utilities and the, the sort of financial decision makers are not that comfortable with doing yeah. initially because it's you're spending money on options that may not come to fruition. You you may not you, know, you might buy some land for um, a connection pipe or, or um, a recycled scheme that might take place sometime in the future. But then you know, things change, um, expectations change, assumptions change, and then you may not go down that pathway. And um, in the view of of some some finance decision makers, they would assume that that is wasted money. But yeah. as the example in, in Melbourne showed that even though you are spending some of this initial um, investment up front on the, on the balance of, of all possible um, outcomes, that is, that is money well worth spent. I guess the key challenge though with, with this approach is, is, um, is convincing the key stakeholder, which are the customers. And so testing the customer's willingness to pay for keeping pathways and options open becomes the ultimate challenge. Um, because I think if you can convince your customers that spending money um, on adaptive planning and flexibility is a good thing, the regulator will can only but follow follow suit and, and then um, yeah. approve your you know, your your finance plans. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Pierre. Uh, I like that uh, approach of uh, not focusing so much on the adaptive plan, but the adaptive planning. Um, one of my mentors used to say, "Don't focus on the good life." focus on good living and it's that uh, organic way of looking at planning and it came up in our group discussion as well that you know this is going to this is going to be one of those ongoing exercises yeah. of looking constantly at what's happening 
I might um, move the discussion to Wayne. Um, Wayne, uh, in a previous discussion, we were talking about uh, this book, uh, Decision Making in Deep Uncertainty, and uh, it was very coincidental that we started talking about the very same subject. Uh, what is this deep uncertainty? Uh, and, and as uh, Pierre alluded, is there really more uncertainty at present than at other periods of time? And um, I might also ask, you know, from a set quarter perspective, how are you applying adaptive planning? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Abel. Thanks, Wayne. Um, yes, the book that, that I was referring to, um, I've, I've learned a lot this afternoon just being part of the, the conversation. I didn't realise it was such a, a revolutionary piece of work. Um, I guess there's one of, one of my roles is to develop our water security program, um, which is our very long-term strategy for augmenting our system to meet expectations of the future. Um, and we sat a couple of years ago with the challenge of plausible futures. And we just sort of sat in that space about what are some of those plausible futures. And I think that's where that, that whole concept of deep uncertainty resonated with me. Um, the book itself um, is a great blend of theory, but also practice. And it outlines some approaches for considering how to handle um, that deep uncertainty, but all with a, a feel to me of, um, if I was to summarize, the need for adaptive thinking, to, to value waiting, to understand the value of waiting, and what are no regrets, that what are some of those no regrets that you, you could be doing now? So there was, there's some very helpful advice um, in there, but the, but the one thing from the book that really grabbed me in terms of the level of deep uncertainty is not only do we um, we struggle to anticipate future technologies and economic drivers and social developments, but for me the the real level of deep uncertainty is around we're not even quite sure what good looks like in 30 years, what our regulators and customers and and service obligations might look like in 30 years. So that for me is the real level of deep uncertainty. Yes, climate change is one of those very uncertain um, drivers, but when you think about not even knowing what good looks like or what your service will look like in 30 years, that, that adds another depth of uncertainty. Um, and in the book it says, you know, the challenge for decision makers are these making short-term decisions that are responding to long-term objectives that may or may not be uncertain and prepare for very rare events of significance. And when I think about water security planning, you mentioned it, you know, it, it's that drought and flood. It, it's the consequence of those sort of, um, th those events and the uncertainty around them into the future, which has is, which is challenged us. Um, and Shane mentioned, you know, um, not to, not to talk out of school, but you do feel that challenge of decision paralysis, path dependency, and, and that sort of option lock-in when you start to feel the need to put down a, a plan. So what is your plan? And, and changing that dialogue from, we don't actually have a plan, we have a strategy. We, have a, a, we, we, we are conscious of the future um, and, and we're adapting our plan uh, to meet. Um, just before, so in the book, there's a particular method called dynamic adaptive planning, which has resonated very much with us here at SEQ Water. Um, it starts with that establishing plausible futures. It does encourage you to have an initial plan, um, which we do need in terms of our, you know, sort of regulatory framework. But then it goes on to things like increasing robustness. And what does that mean in terms of taking some anticipatory, anticipatory actions? then monitor that plan. And we've spoken about that. What are some of the contingent actions along that pathway? Uh, looking, what signals are you going to look for in terms of um, contingent actions? And what are the trigger points for making decisions um, to adapt and change the plan and then continually update the plan? So there was, if I was to say, you know, there's one part of that um, deep uncertainty theory that has really resonated with us is that dynamic adaptive planning, because uh, it, it sort of 
blends with what we have to do as a, a regulated entity, but also allows us that flexibility to stay open and consider the future more, more in, a, in a more wholesome way. I hope that answers the question, Abel. Thanks, thanks, Wayne. We will come back to that, but uh, it, it's a really good segue. We couldn't have scripted this better, but uh, Andrew, you, you actually wrote that uh, chapter in that book on dynamic adaptive policy pathways. And you talk about you know different roads leading to Rome sort of scenario. Um, I'm thinking also about you know, what Wayne said about, we don't know what good looks like in 30 years. So how do we know whether we should be going to Rome or to Milan instead? So uh, yeah, could, you, could you comment on that and also explore what you mean by tipping points or adaptation tipping point conditions? Um, I'll throw that, throw that to you, Andrew. Yeah, no, no worries. Thanks, Abel. Um, just, just to clarify, uh, for those who are interested, I've put a link to, to the book in the chat. Um, it is freely available to download. Um, and uh, just, just to clarify, the the approach that um, that Wayne was referring to, dynamic adaptive planning, that's a, that's a an approach that was formulated a, a little while, ago, quite. 10, 15 years ago by, by a colleague at uh, TU Delft, um, Warren Walker, and it served as an input um, or as, a, as very much an influence um, on the dynamic adaptive policy pathways approach, which, which I'm, I'm much more familiar with um, and to which the chapter of which I contributed in the book. Um, so when, to, to go back to your questions, Abel, like you say, we talk about many roads leading to Rome um, and whether or not uh, actually should we start thinking about, well, does the road lead to Rome at all? I think that's a really interesting point. And I think um, when we formulated the pathways approach, it was very much from this perspective of uh, a single goal. And um, that reflects the Dutch experience, particularly when it comes to flood protection where it's such an existential um, question for, 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 this, for this country, where you protect the land at whatever cost. And this idea of, 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 of creating an adaptation pathway to allow you to protect that land, whatever the um, uh, river discharges or sea level rise conditions may, uh, may, may bring, um, that was your road, right? But I think um, in the intervening years, we've very much come to the realization that, yeah, Rome is certainly not a fixed place and Milan is definitely an option. Uh, and these are the types of discussions that are going on again here in, in the Netherlands. In, in the last couple of years, there's been uh, some, some additional work done in relation to accelerated sea level rise, for example, where at the moment the, the IPCC is, is predicting that, you know, we might have to deal with one metre sea level rise by the end of the, the, end of the century. But um, they're also saying, well, actually, that could be as high as two or three in extreme, extreme conditions. Um, and then in terms of what happens beyond 2100 and, and heading towards 2200 and even 2300, I mean, the sea level rise could be astronomical. And protecting a country against, you know, potentially five metre, six metre sea level rise, um, particularly when half the country is already below sea level, is, is a pretty, pretty massive question. So there has been a transition in thinking here where the discussion is now commencing, well, do we protect at all costs or do we need to think about a different objective? Is, should our objective change to being, well, should we look at accommodating the water and uh, living differently, and maybe protecting just particular high-value parts of parts of the land, um, but but allowing, you know, the the, the less valuable parts to to, to flood. Uh, should we be talking to upstream neighbours about you know regional migration, these sorts of things? Like yeah. we're we're talking about things that are a hundred years into the future. So of course there is so much uncertainty, and. Um, not to mention, um, uh, you know, it's it's out of our lifetime, so it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily influence influence us personally. But the thinking about these types of issues and, and your end goal um, needs to 
uh, needs to occur and needs to update as new information comes to light. And I mean, this thinking has changed in, in 10 years. Um, to, to briefly touch on tipping points, um, that came through in the game, I think. I think most people would, would have seen that we had those critical thresholds at which uh, the, 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 the flood protection structures would, would work. And it's this idea, um, when we talk about tipping points, Perhaps the language is a little bit clumsy. I prefer mm. much more to talk about thresholds yeah. um, because a tipping point suggests that uh, once you've tipped, you cannot tip back. Um, but the idea is more that it is a condition where we define our system as no longer performing acceptably. And what we mean by that is it can be anything. So that though the criteria for acceptable performance, it might be as simple as, you know, a dike, a dike level, or it could be a social condition. Um, for water supply systems, it could be unmet demand. Um, it could be anything, but it's just, how do we define the point at which we're saying, no, nah, this does not work anymore, and we need to do something. That's that's essentially what that tipping point is. And I think I've spoken enough, so. Thanks, I'll thanks Andrew. It no, it's, it's a lot of food for thought in that. So uh, I would recommend people do get hold of that paper and read through that as well. Um, there's actually a question from the floor, which uh, I think David, uh, you'd, you'd be uh, well placed to try and respond to this. Um, they're looking for a comment from you on the trend of using adaptive planning techniques to support uh, utilities like Hunter Water in your pricing submissions. And how do you bring the regulators and your organization around um, and uh, you know, support this, uh, this pricing submission? What sort of adaptive planning approaches are you using and um, how are you going to respond to the new pricing determination that sort of gives you an adjustable mechanism, if you like? Over to you, David. Good. That's a good question, Zena. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I was going to mention is that um, as a regulated water business where we have this deeply ingrained attitude around lease cost servicing for current regulatory settings and so that really um, conflicts with you know long-term adaptive planning. Um, the work that we did with biosolids um, really highlighted the fact that if we wanted to move towards our strategic goals around carbon neutrality, resource recovery, um, but at the same time maintaining affordability, that, um, that lease cost model didn't really suit. And so the adaptive pathways um, method really helped us to work through the uncertainty in that problem space. And, that, and, and in that case, we're really looking at what product markets are we looking at? Um, do we want to start working with the organic market? Um, what technology options do we have? And so it's a long-term plan. And when we looked at the long-term potential trends and shocks in that space, um, we found that our options were moving in the same direction. And so um, at that point, um, it became a question of, well, how do we best navigate that pathway over time with investment decisions linked to certain triggers, whether that be regulatory changes or, or market changes, things like that. Um, again, that's, that's a difficult discussion to have in a, a four year pricing um, uh, framework, but um, the, the discussions that we had with with IPART were, were open to that. If you can make that strategic case, um, and, and obviously IPART are keen to see the buy-in of regulators um, into that process. Um, but also, I don't know who mentioned it earlier. Um, getting customer support for that. I was. I'd also, if I can, just kind of jump over to the water side, um, which is something that I'm working on at the moment. Um, and one of the things we're looking at, which I think is a really good example of adaptive pathways, one of the options we're looking at as part of the, the lower hundred water security plan is um, purified recycled water drinking. And one of the key uncertainties for this option is community and regulator attitudes. And so adaptive planning has been really helpful for us to think through how to develop options like this. What actions do we need to take now so that we can keep that option open on the table for later? And things like community engagement, regulator engagement, demonstration plants that can provide the information and, and the room for discussion so that at a later point in time, we give ourselves the best chance of being able to deliver on that on that action. 
So there, there's some examples of how we've used it. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, Jafar, Jafari has asked a really uh, critical question, but I think it's almost like a PhD subject, Jafari. Um, he's in, interested in knowing, you know, how have we compared the benefits of adaptive planning approach versus the traditional, um, although he does recognize that adaptive planning is becoming more BAU, but, um, you know, what's the advantage of um, adaptive planning, particularly where you can make decisions later? In other words, the heuristic value or time value of, um, you know, the options that are open to you. There's no futures value of some of these options. Has anyone started to capture some of that uh, added value? In other words, how much is the option worth in the future? We had a go at it. Uh -huh. I don't know. I don't know if we landed the work. Um, I think um, the work made its way to the regulator, but I don't know if it was conclusive. But it effectively looked at looking backwards at shocks that we'd seen in the um, in the water system, things like new technologies, things like um, new regulation and policy, like BASICs. Mm. And if you project those forward, what sort of impact could they have um, on um, on long run costs and um, the, um, the economist that did the work suggested that there's an additional benefit on top of your standard deferral benefits through an incremental approach of around about 10%. Um, but I should say that work um, wasn't kind of signed off by the regulator, but it was, um, it was an interesting piece of work that shows that there is a case to be made be above and beyond the deferral benefits through an incremental approach, which I think is um, broadly what Pierre was speaking to earlier around the, um, the Melbourne example. Hey, Matt, just to jump in, um, that economist, David, did publish a paper on that work. Um, I can probably find the link somewhere. I don't know how we can make stuff available to the people that are attending this seminar because the work we did for the Melbourne um, planning was has also been published. So that also shows that case where incremental um, spending gives you a better um, economic outcome on the whole. Yeah, just on that point, thanks, Pierre. Uh, that paper would be really useful. Um, please do uh, share that information with Amanda from AWA. She's uh, representing the young water professionals here today. And uh, I would also encourage um, the attendees to connect up with, um, with Pierre um, and also the AWA, because we are trying to put together uh, some of the key points that came out of today's uh, workshop. Um, I'd like to maybe just bring it back to Wayne, particularly with long-lived assets. Wayne, um, are you looking at any optionality around long-lived assets once you build a big transmission main, for instance, or a water treatment plant? Um, That's ultimately one of the big challenges, Abel, isn't it? Yes. Um, <clears throat> part of our water security program is is about articulating when we when we believe we're unable to meet our levels of service in terms of supply, whether that's meeting you know um, supply levels in drought or um, peak demand, mm. um, and and historical thinking or contemporary thinking is that we need to augment the system. So we jump straight into our options assessment, um, and there's a lot of um, processes and and governance around options assessment, but it definitely it definitely quickly turns into a, how big are we gonna build it and where and how much is it gonna cost? Um, and, and, and we're talking about billion dollar type solutions that are on the table here. Um, David raised a really good point about PRW. Well, we've sort of built some PRW plants here in Southeast Queensland. Um, so one option on our, you know, one thing that we're looking at as a, as a disruption, a, a disruptive type um, option might be direct potable reuse. You know, they're the sort of things that will come onto the table in the next 30 or 50 years. Um, but but definitely real options is, um, is where we're heading with uh, our thinking at this stage in terms of really understanding um, what influences we can have around some policy setting or regulatory setting, um, what influences we can have around managing demand on the system, and then sort of setting those into our dynamic pathway um, and considering them 
as real options uh, alongside uh, just jumping to a what we would call an augmentation or a contingency infrastructure solution. <clears throat> I, I just jump in there. I just see there's another comment from Sean Gilchrist and he makes a comment about having the right people in the room. And I think that's that's been really valuable from Hunter Water to broaden that the context of our discussion. So we worked with um, CSIRO to develop some um, plausible futures and we brought in a few external um, stakeholders into that process. And it was really helpful for us to kind of take the, the engineering blinkers off and understand from um, external stakeholders and regional partners, their view of both the, the problem and the, and the solution space. And mm -hmm. there's that the, the knowledge values and rules framework that I think is really helpful to, um, to, to work through that. Um, it is, Sean also says, it's um, you know difficult knowing where to start. There's a lot of really good consultants that we've worked with. Um, I probably shouldn't name them, but um, um, in the water industry, um, where we're talking, as you said, mentioned, Abel, we're talking often about long life assets and how do you make um, make decisions um, in in deep uncertainty. And so there's a lot of good work that's going on, and um, there's a pretty collegiate atmosphere around the industry. So hopefully, you don't have to go too far to find some some advice. Yeah. The other the other thing able to to note is that you can shorten your risk framework or your risk time around that significant investment by taking some of those I was referring to before, those no regret type actions around some pathways. So um, for example, you could be procuring land, doing some environmental state studies, doing some concept design. You could be progressing some of those very significant infrastructure options to give you the advantage of a, of a to wait a wait time but because you're building you're reducing your exposure to the big capital items um, that we often see you know we start too late and then we and then we have the full six or eight years of a big project delivery um, and the momentum around that that just runs from start to finish yeah. whereas if you can break that up and and start to prepare a pathway through some no regrets type investment um, yeah. that's also been shown to be to be wise. Yeah, I think that's that's really true with um, the sort of boundaries that we set around the, the problem, you know, how we define the problem often need to be tested too, don't they? I mean, you, you might have a time boundary and you can buy time by doing some of those no regrets, mm. uh, which mm. increases mm. the time bounds of your problem. Mm. But also mm. looking at, uh, I think, optionality. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, changing the boundaries of your area of operation, you might be able to derive some benefits, improving the health of the receiving waters, for instance, which buys you time and significantly longer time frames than just upgrading a, a wastewater treatment plant. Yeah. Um, I might uh, just open it up now to any closing thoughts from any of the panel. I think we've dealt with all the questions, but if there's any uh, other thoughts that you might have in mind, particularly given that last question about how do we now get the industry as a whole to really put the effort into bringing the right people into the into the room, uh, defining things better and taking adaptive planning forward. So I'll open it up, but if you'd like to maybe just have some thoughts, closing comments, please. Maybe I'll just, oh, um, I think from the experience that we've had, one of the key things is getting a common language. So we, yeah. so we're all speaking about the same things, and and when we're talking about scenarios, or we're talking about futures, or just the, the terminology should be consistent. So it's at least we can share. So if we share our experiences and, and documents, at least it's um, there's some consistency there, and also just understanding the principles. And so things like plans versus planning that we keep saying, or keeping options open on the table, just it sounds like jargon, but if that becomes the way we talk and we're all using the same terms, it'll become just naturally what what we what we do and 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 say. Thanks, Pierre. Um, if I can jump in next, um, I, I I want to reflect a little bit more on uh, Sean's quite extensive comment where he mentioned that you know they'd had they'd also had a go at trying to do this stuff, but uh, um, and 
but with unreceptives in the room and, and the you know there was initial buzz and the outcomes didn't didn't quite match with with the expectations and I think what my, my, my reflection of that on that is that I think one of the most important things with adaptive planning is that we need to manage expectations mm -hmm. um, it's not a silver bullet it doesn't just because we start planning adaptively doesn't mean that planning becomes easy and that the solution is found that 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 that's that that's not what adaptive planning is as I, as hopefully today's um <clears throat> webinar has explained you know it's very much a journey it's a it's it's something that continuously unfolds um and it can be an extremely messy process uh so i think managing stakeholder expectations within this process is absolutely fundamental uh and what we've what we've sort of found at deltaris in in recent times is um often it's better to start uh not trying to find the answer but rather thinking about exploring potential futures um, and potential options so it's uh if, if i go back to that example that i mentioned in terms of accelerated sea level rise in in the netherlands no one's creating a plan to deal with that yet no one's creating you know looking at how high the dikes need to be or how wide they need to be so that they can be flexibly raised in the future no one's looking at which which locations to to prioritize for protection um, or anything like that it's not being specified yet all that's happening is that there is a discussion going on okay this could happen yeah. what would we do in that instance we're exploring that future so it's this idea of the bringing back that iterative nature of the process hmm. and bringing back the idea that you start very, very big, very, very broad, very, very much in terms of the vision space. Um, and I, I hear from from David, that's what they did with, with, with CSIRO and yeah. looking at what the potential future could be. And then you start bringing that back down, start increasing the complexity, increasing the detail with with increasing levels of analysis. And I think that would be my, my, my closing point for, for this morning. Thanks, and I'd really reiterate that. I was going to mention that it's no silver bullet. And um, I hate to say it, but when we first saw the Deltaire's tool, I thought, great, this is going to, this is going to give us the answer. It looks so great. And I don't think they'd um, be concerned about me saying this, but um, it's not the answer. It, mm. It's a useful tool to help you work through a problem. But at the end of the day, um, you have to work through your problem space and, and, and kind of pull that apart and understand what the different levers and, and triggers and options and um, issues that we, you need to resolve. And, and adaptive planning is one tool, one line of evidence that um, you, know, you can use to support good decision making. And it's not, um, it's not gonna roll everything up into a, into a nice bundle and give you the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne? I was just gonna say it's a, it for for us, there's also challenges around customer need, engaging with the customers who, um, <clears throat> and that's whether you're talking about our retailer customers or the 3.2 million people who live in Southeast Queensland. Hmm. Um, the language changes from, yes, we've got a plan to actually, our plan is adaptive and we're not in a position to be able to say, this is exactly what we're gonna be doing here in 20 years time to, and 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 seeing the benefit and the value in engaging customers because in that discussion is some of the pathway some mm -hmm. of the possible adaption is in engaging with customers more fully around mm -hmm. what future expectations will be but also trying to establish that more relaxed um you know rather than having to to actually come out and nominate your solution for what you're going to do in 10 years time or yeah. 20 years time or to, mm -hmm. to, to, to work in that space um, <clears throat> truthfully and respectfully is, is often quite challenging. Yeah, thanks Lee, that's, that's a great note. And uh, Sean Gilchrist uh, just came back and said that that was actually his, um, his experience as well, that people issues are uh, central uh, mm. and uh, yeah, they shouldn't be discounted at all. So mm. that's, that's a good thought. And particularly, I think as natural monopolies, um, you you have to sort of take that wider view. It's not like you know, people have a choice as to where to get water or 
wastewater services. So mm. thanks again. Um, thank you, panel. And I'm sure if everyone could clap and uh, ex express their appreciation, they would. I'm going to hand it over back to Kate Lansky. And um, Kate's going to do some closing comments and uh, a vote of thanks. Over to you, Kate. Thanks, Thanks Abel. And look, I'm conscious of time and it's 10 past six in New South Wales and it, the morning sun is just rising where Andrew is. So I'll keep it pretty brief. But I just wanted to say thank you very much for attending. And um, I hope that everybody got something out of the session using the um, fusion of technologies as we went through it and played the game. And um, the key objective that we had setting out was that it would would be a learning experience for everyone with some really rich discussions and I think that um, occurred from my perspective and what I could see. Um, I guess um, the panel summarised it very well but for me personally I think it's pretty exciting to be a part of the industry at the moment where there's clearly a transition occurring from the traditional planning approaches to you know an adaptive planning approach where we can manage some of those future uncertainties. And lastly, but certainly, certainly not um, least, is a huge thanks to everybody who was behind the scenes coordinating this session. It took a few people and um, a lot of planning to make it happen. So thanks to AWA and their team, Tanya Cameron and Amanda Tobias, um, and from Oricon, Chris Saxby and Avona Marek did a huge effort um, to make everything run smoothly. So thank you. And also, of course, to our panel members, Wayne Middleton, David Durkeen, Andrew Warren and Pierre McIver. Um, and also to the hosts and other presenters, um, Simone de Clearmaker, Shane Tyrrell and also to Abel for um, facilitating the panel. So on that note, thank you all and look forward to catching up at some point in the future um, at another AWA event perhaps. Thank you.